Hola, bienvenidos, uh, welcome, herzlich willkommen. Um, uh, this is going to be in English, so I hope this is okay for you. And uh, my name is Lorenzo Caras, I am an architect. I am originally from Vienna, living in Spain for many, many years, a director of guiding architects in Barcelona. And I brought this exhibition here with the idea to foster the exchange between Austria and Spain. Uh, first of all, I want to thank. I want to thank the, the Architecture Chamber of Madrid, the COAM, to make this uh, possible with general, generous hospitality and the Affordable Housing Activation Forum, which this is a side event. And especially, I want to thank Elena Zucchini, the city of Vienna, uh, Christoph Schantl, the Austrian Cultural Forum, who made this also possible, MVD Austria, Christian Daschek, and Esther Jimenez from ADA. Without them, this wouldn't have been possible. So today, the, the availability of affordable housing is a very big topic around the world in big cities, and one of the main challenges we have to face. And there's a very diverse balance between public and private housing, ownership and rental housing, rising prices due to speculation, lack of building land, and they make this basic human need um, to a rare good in many cities, and it requires creativity and long-term solutions. In this sense, the city of Vienna has been, uh, well, it looks back to 100 years of traditions. You know, it started with this, well, designing and implementing innovative strategies of affordable housing and urban development also. It starts with this famous Red Vienna, you might have heard of, during the interwar period, followed by a reconstruction of the Second World War, and then a transition from municipal housing towards subsidized social housing. And so they not only construct projects with high quality all over the city, but also construct entire parts of the city. So it's also a city that grows very, very much, and many people Maybe they don't know this. So as a consequence, nowadays in Vienna, we have about 60% of its population uh, living in so-called social housing units with a stock of about 220,000 municipal housings and over 200,000 housings that, of affordable housing that have been created. So the purpose of the event of today is on one hand to introduce and discuss this Viennese model, uh, as well as to foster this exchange of mutual learning between Austria, Spain, Vienna, Madrid, on sustainable, innovative strategies towards affordable housing, and we will focus on the topic of co-housing as one of those possible typologies also within the affordable social housing. Maybe some words to the exhibition. The exhibition is curated by Wolfgang Förster and William Menik, Menkin, and was initially conceived in, uh, for New York in 2013 for the Austrian Cultural Forum, and then redesigned as a traveling exhibition, and then went to many different cities all over the world, um, all over continents, and lately in July last year, it was also in Barcelona, where we organized a similar debate. So the exhibition design you will see, the exhibition is downstairs. It is based on a scaffolding system and easily to adapt to these different venues. It's uh, structured in 12 thematics, and the idea is to somehow transmit the different dimensions, historic, political, urban, social, environmental, cultural, artistic. So you will see it yourself, and you can see it until the 28th of May. So we will start today with uh, our guests. So I'm very happy that we have Katharina Bayer from Eins zu Eins Architektur in Vienna that came here specially for um, this event. Uh, she will give a talk about their work, focusing on, on co-housing, and then we have also Professor Carmen Espejel, who is also here to uh, show us um, the case of Spain and social housing, and then focus on, also on, on examples of co-housing. Maybe some words to Katarina Baia. She studied architecture at the Technical University of Vienna and Delft. She founded in 2006 Eins zu Eins Architektur together with Markus Zilka. And she's a member of the Housing Initiative Council of the City of Vienna, visiting professor at the University of Technology, 
Urban Development, and she's Jury Chairwoman of the Austrian State Prize for Architecture and Sustainability. So their work focuses a lot of housing construction in different scales, and um, understanding it as a social and urban task at the interface of people and the city. And they are specialized in cooperative and participatory planning with a very intensive dialogue with the clients and future users with the idea of this holistic concept of architecture being sustainable and integrative. And they received numerous prizes and awards, such as the Austrian State Prize for Architecture and the Hans Sauer Prize. So, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Lorenzo, for the introduction, for the invitation to come here to talk about our work in the frame of this uh, very interesting exhibition. Um, I um, will, I have to do it in this direction, that's, <laughs> um, I will give a short introduction about the office and then talk about current challenges uh, for housing in Vienna and also a bit about the general framework um, for architects in housing, because this is very special, of course, um, in Vienna uh, compared to other cities. And I want to um, then go on with some case studies, some projects um, of ours, not only co-housing, but also others, and give a short conclusion. Um, yeah, so let us start. Um, this is our office. We are approximately 20 people. Um, our office is in one of our projects, in Bon Projekt Wien. And of course, all our work is teamwork. Uh, so this is why I want to give a picture of the whole team uh, who is actually responsible for all these nice projects. Uh, we are um, focusing on housing, uh, but also urban design a bit. And as uh, Lorenzo said, we have this special focus on co-housing, participation in housing. And actually 50% of our projects are these participatory projects. Um, like many offices, young offices, we started with small-scale um, projects, also mainly single-family housing. And what we liked about this actually is that you can uh, work very close with the future users. And we always saw it as a big inspiration to our work to really be very close to their needs and, uh, and design very special um, architecture. And I think the Baba Papa House is one of the best examples and also internationally known, so <laughs> that's why uh, I show it. And, uh, but also we already knew then that with the single family house we are working in a field that is not very sustainable uh, because we use too much land, too much resources, it produces too much traffic and um, that's why we thought uh, if we should go on like this, also because we as a society cannot afford it um, for everybody and um, uh, not only on the ecological aspect but also on the economic aspect. If you see this, you see the cost of the infrastructural costs for um, uh, single family housing development compared to more dense um, uh, um, housing and you see that it's 10 times higher only the infrastructural costs and then I do not only I do not even talk about the ecological costs uh, that that follow so we have to think about alternatives and as an office we said we want to contribute to these alternatives of course the other option is to live within the densified city this is a picture of Vienna um, which is more efficient of course it's easier to um, to organize traffic infrastructure um, it's easier um, uh, to, to build in an ecological way, but uh, of course it shows it deficits maybe more on the individual level because you have very few options um, of personal expression, uh, although we live very close together in the city, often there is a lack of communication um, uh, between the neighbors, it's very anonymous. And um, that's why we thought, how can we bring together the best of these two uh, ways of living, the, the very individual um, single family house and the densified housing? How can we bring it together? And then, of course, it's not only about the ecological aspects, but we are facing many challenges as a society. I just want to point out some uh, things that also are um, important for the housing in Vienna. For instance, you can see that the uh, living space per capita doubled from 1971 
from 29 to 44 approximately square meters. And this is also an ecological problem, but it's also uh, a problem of affordability because actually, of course, you you pay your housing per square meter and uh, actually it makes housing uh, um, more expensive to, uh, to the individual. Um, for instance, in Vienna, they um, uh, reacted on that by introducing the Smart Housing Program. That's a very special uh, housing program within the subsidized housing where they limit uh, the living area, the surface of the flats, uh, so that you have a very sufficient apartment uh, that actually with the aim that it is more affordable. Uh, and actually about 50% of the apartments in Vienna are, are these smart housing uh, uh, apartments. Then you can also see that single households uh, are rising. The family households actually are minorities, the green uh, columns you see uh, uh, since 1950, it's really uh, an, a decrease in, in family housing. And with this single family housing, there comes along many other problems like loneliness or dissolving of family ties. So um, actually, what we think as an office is that we also have to not only build more small apartments, but we have to somehow reorganize um, um, the relation between the individual and the family and the community uh, in a new way. And you can do this by typologies like duplex architects did in, uh, in uh, Zurich. I think it's a very nice example, this cluster housing. You can find new typologies, but of course architecture is not the only way to solve these problems. Um, another fact that we have to take uh, insight when we talk about housing is that these, the society is getting older. I think it's the same uh, all over Europe. Um, and these people will not all be healthy when they are old. So we have to rethink also our system of care, how, how we really be able to live uh, when we are old. And uh, we know that the state cannot guarantee for it. It's uh, uh, also an economic question, but also the private uh, system of care is dissolving the family and the women that are making the care work. So what we also have to take in, um, in insight is how can we find new networks, helping networks uh, in, a, in a private uh, relation. So we are facing all these very different challenges, economic, social, and ecological. And it's, of course, also clear that um, with top-down solutions, it's hard to find answers to complex um, challenges. Uh, and we in Vienna, of course, had very long, a very strong top-down development of housing. This is a cartoon by Gustav Peichel in, uh, made in the 70s after this industrial way of, of building housings. And uh, so we have to not only think of new forms of housing, but also about the process of how we build our housing, how we get there. And uh, we are in the lucky situation actually in Vienna that we do not only have a long tradition in social housing, in top-down maybe, uh, if you want to call it a social housing, like the Karl Marxhof on the left uh, side, uh, on the right side for you, um, but we also actually have a long tradition in participation in uh, densified housing. You see some pictures in, in the left corner and in the down corner from Ottokar Uhl, who, is, who was one of the pioneers of participation uh, in Austria and also in social infrastructure within the housing. I brought the example of um, Alt Erla, um, which Harry Glück, where you see there is a bathing pool on the top. So we have a very strong uh, tradition and we have already many answers in our portfolio. And um, this brings me uh, to the general framework for architects uh, in housing in Vienna. And, uh, Every city, of course, is different and, and Vienna is very special when it comes to housing and it's best shown with the numbers, so I'll start with the numbers. Um, the city of Vienna consists of approximately 900,000 flats for 1.8 million people and 77% of the flats are rented, so it's a strong rental market. Uh, and with 220,000 flats, the city of Vienna is the biggest owner of flats uh, within the city. It's the social housing program of the Red Vienna that we knew uh, from the, that started in the 20s and stopped some 
somewhere in the 60s, 70s. Um, and after that came uh, the system of subsidized housing, um, which is developed by non-profit, special non-profit developers or limited profit developers. And there is another 250,000 flats in the, within this system. So actually you see that more of half of the flats uh, in Vienna is somehow regulated by the city by subsidies or social housing. And it, this has a strong impact on the market, of course. It's uh, not a free market if you want. Uh, the housing market in Vienna is very strong influenced by the city. Um, and this, of course, makes a big difference. Yeah, this already I showed, Karl Marxhof. This was this uh, social housing um, developed by the city, owned by the city. The city never sold these apartments, so they still own them, which is very important. Um, and after um, this social housing, when the city stopped to build the houses by themselves, they introduced this system of subsidized housing uh, by non-profit developers. And since 1995, we have this instrument of developer competitions based on a four pillar system. So every uh, social housing, every um, um, uh, yeah, every housing actually is judged uh, along this four uh, pillar system. Uh, you have aspects of social sustainability, architecture, economy, and ecology. And only if and the best project will always be the one that is that shows innovation and qualities in all four uh, pillars. So that actually guarantees that the housing that is produced in Vienna is a sustainable development. And it's not only good in one aspect, but it's an overall um, view um, also on the cultural aspects. What I was talking about before, that maybe we have to change from top-down solutions to, uh, to other ways of planning, um, I want to point out again here is that we have to need we need to change our planning processes from a linear top-down planning um, where urban design, or architecture follows urban design and then the users come in at, uh, uh, at the very end uh, to more dynam dynamic um, bottom-up planning processes where we start to develop all these aspects together, um, which actually makes it then possible that all um, needs and ideas are integrated in the planning process and the developer competitions already integrate a lot of um, knowledge and and different disciplines uh, when you um, when you want to take part in a developer competition you have to make teams of a developer architect landscape architect very often we work with sociologists of course engineers but also social organizations and what is new actually um, is that also with the participation with co-housing that also the user can take part then in these um, processes. So um, this is a good basis of course for co-housing. I want to, before I talk about co-housing I want to give a, a small um, uh, definition because co-housing is uh, many different you see many different kinds of co-housing in Europe but maybe what what is a summary or a definition that fits to all is that co-housing projects are co-initiated and co-created by the future users and they actually have two major goals that is to build together and or to live together and I would say in Vienna it's more about this living together because the city builds a wonderful flat, so building is not a problem. In Berlin, it was maybe the other way around. But to live in another way, in a more community-based way, actually is what you can gain or what is the main motivation to join a co-housing in Vienna. Which brings me to our first project, our first co-housing project, we realized the Wohnprojekt Wien. And of course, when you talk about co-housing, um, one point is that such a program um, such a project doesn't start with the architecture, but actually it starts with the people and it starts with a vision. Like uh, in Wohnprojekt Wien, it was um, a group of 15 people that um, before they found a plot uh, actually came together to create a vision of how they want to live together in a sustainable way within the city, um, um, bring together individuality and community. And uh, with these 15 people, actually, we then tried to find uh, a plot, which is not easy in a growing city, as you can imagine, to find an affordable plot, central, and so on. So then the idea came up that the group could make a cooperation 
collaboration with a non-profit developer. At that time, there was um, the competition at Nordbahnhof, um, where we then took Play, took um, part in with this project team, so we found a non-profit developer that took the risk to make a cooperation with um, the association of Wohnprojekt Wien, and um, we applied for together for a site, um, and yeah, this was the competition entry, and we were lucky and won the competition. And actually, it was the first time that a group of private people together with a developer could win such a competition. One has to say that for private groups, the developer competition was not open until that, so they could not apply without a developer. So it was important to make this team. Yeah, we had a party, very important, but it was also clear that these 15 people had to enlarge the group. So we started with info meetings uh, to find um, the future neighbors. We designed a, a blog for 40 apartments. So and they searched for their future neighbors. There was great interest. And in short, actually, we had this group of approximately 50 people. And together with this group, uh, we went into the further participatory planning process, which we always try to make um, very broad so that there is really participation from the urban design to the electric socket, as we say. And we organize it in three levels. You have the individual level of participation, which is regarding your own flat. Then um, you, we always talk uh, work with big models so that everybody really can take part in this design of his or her flat. Uh, then we have a working group on architecture, actually making most of the decisions on the general um, spaces and the community spaces and details. And for very important questions, we try to involve the whole group, um, for instance, for the program of the community spaces or the distribution of the flats. So with, uh, with these important questions, we work with the whole group. We started into a participation with the aim to make it more than once, and that was why the organization of how we go into these processes was very important for us. And we said we have one... Um, uh, we have one rule, and that is uh, we don't want to work with spaces democracy because uh, we learned from the projects from the 70s, then the projects get very long and the decision making is a very long process and you get burned out on the way. So we introduced the system of sociocracy, uh, which is actually, you can have an own lecture about this, but uh, the, the main thing is that it spreads uh, the decision making to um, to many groups, working groups. And for instance, the group of architecture is our direct, I cannot see the pointer, I don't know if it, <laughs> if it works, but the uh, group of architecture is then our direct, um, consisting of eight to 10 people is our direct um, um, uh, partner within most of the decisions. And um, yeah, this brings me to the architecture and the facts. The Wohnprojekt Wien, as it is built from the backside, today approximately 100 people live there. They live in 39 apartments. Uh, each of the, these apartments is different. It's organized uh, along a central hallway. And you see through the participation, um, each apartment is different, which also means that we actually didn't design a housing um, block and fixed everything, but we designed a system that is open to adaptability within the competition and then we filled in uh, the program with the people. Um, we also have there 350 square meters of commerce in the ground floor. We have our office there, for instance. We have this uh, cafe and grocery store that is run by eight people from the association and that is also contributing to the neighborhood. Um, we have uh, the basement um, with a big event space and a workshop. Altogether, we have 700 square meters of community spaces there. So it's a lot of space for the community. Uh, in the ground floor, we have a community kitchen. Next to it, there's this children playroom. You see this um, aim they had, this... Um, uh, architecture where you where you can see each other, where you can meet. And for instance, one of the goals of the parents was that they can see the children, but they don't have to hear them. And that's why uh, we have this glazing around the, <laughs> the children playroom. And yeah, that's a very uh, funny detail. The whole rooftop is for the community. This is maybe one of, um, one of the things that always is the outcome when you make community uh, project that the best um, 
the best parts of the house are reserved for the community. We have a sauna there, we have a library, we have guest apartments and a rooftop garden. And as uh, sustainability was important, um, the project is not only about housing, but it's also about mobility. There is a big uh, bicycle storage, there is a um, cargo bike sharing, a workshop for repairing bikes, all shared and very um, yeah, prominent in the ground floor. We have a car sharing uh, integrated in the project. We have these vegetable gardens that are also shared with the neighborhood. So really many, many things that you couldn't do if you, if you would uh, build a fa one family house, for instance. And uh, what is important to say is that the association of Wohnprojekt Wien bought the house from the developer after um, finishing the construction. So they are owning the house uh, as a, a shared ownership. Uh, and so each um, a member of the association is owner of the house and tenant because they, and they make a contract. This is what you see here, the youngest and the oldest uh, a member of the association. Uh, and they, they hand over the keys to themselves. <laughs> it's quite nice. But it's important to say that you have these two hats and it's not only one perspective you have on the house, but you have these uh, two perspectives uh, within the association. Yeah, then I want to show a second project just in short because many things are similar actually from this project to the other, but it shows a bit the uh, evolution of co-housing maybe in Vienna of the, of the last years. Um, the first project was a kind of pioneer project and after that the city of Vienna started co-housing um, competitions also, so where groups could actually apply for a site without a developer or with a developer, they could decide for themselves, which gave a lot of power of course to the groups and, uh, and also uh, triggered the, the co-housing um, projects in Vienna, which we have a lot of since that. And uh, what the city actually saw is that these co-housing projects are quite good pioneers for new urban developments. They actually promote diversity, social interaction, and also uh, contribute uh, to the liveliness of the neighborhood. So the city also started to use them as a strategic um, part in, in new urban developments, as for instance here, uh, it's a new urban area, the Sonnenviertel, uh, near to the new main station in Vienna. And you see these yellow uh, um, plots were reserved within the master plan for co-housing, so their uh, groups could apply for these plots. And there were other, there was social housing, there was free financed housing, there was mixed use. So uh, it, the idea was to have many different uh, actors within the production of, of this part of the city. And uh, we um, uh, initiated a group in this case, so, and uh, this was um, called Gleis 21. Uh, and um, yeah, this is the project team again. Uh, and this, here you see the core group after winning uh, the competition. Uh, again, it was 15 to 20 people that started uh, the project. And what was different maybe to, to other co-housing projects is that the city didn't only ask for a community um, concept, but uh, the groups were also asked for a program for the ground floor um, that will contribute to the new uh, neighborhood. And for Class 21 had a lot of people from the cultural section. Um, they decided to make um, a cultural emphasis there. There is a big... Um, cultural hall, event space, there is a music school now, and uh, yeah, this already was um, within the concept from the first uh, competition, and actually um, then now really the group runs these cultural spaces. Um, yeah, it's, the fact is it's uh, 34 apartments, it was finished in 2019 and we have these 500 square meters of cultural use and 350 square meters of community spaces in the rooftop. Um, this is um, the ground floor as it, is, as it was built then. Uh, you see this, um, this big cultural hall, there is an atelier and cafe again and in the basement there is the music school. There was also crowdfunding for the um, uh, for the for, for, for um, the program, but also um, for the um, 
technique and everything. So the whole neighborhood was already involved very early in this in this new uh, cultural hall for this new uh, urban area. And I think this is also a good way to activate um, to activate the, the a new area. Of course, Corona stopped a bit the program in the last years, but uh, now they are coming back with theatre, uh, cinema, and so on. You see that each apartment, again, is different. Um, it's a bit different. You have this open portico and the private side on the other side. Each apartment is facing two sides. But uh, in this case, it is a timber construction. And again, we try to make this very open ground floor to make possible um, the individualization within the, uh, within the flats. Yes, yeah, some impressions from this open portico. And uh, the rooftop, which is reserved for the community again, um, with um, a community kitchen, a sauna again, and, and a big rooftop garden with a nice view. Yeah, and then I want to end with another pro... Uh, yeah, maybe, uh, I don't know if, if time is still okay, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I want to show one other project because um, we always we do a lot of co-housing, but we also always try to learn from co-housing what can we integrate in other normal, I would say normal social housing projects. What what can we learn from that or what, what uh, can we do in a more... Um, uh, simple way because co-housing as you saw is a lot of work for all the <laughs> for all the people involved and not everybody of course can do that and uh, we uh, so i want to point out this project which we did together with um, uh, trans city architects uh, finished in 2018 it was also a developer competition uh, that we won uh, consisting of 129 housing units um, in four houses, you have shared apartments for elderly, also a kindergarten, which shows that social infrastructure is always integrated in the housing in Vienna, and also community spaces are quite common. Uh, and a special thing, this is the project team uh, that we invented there, was the idea of how can we build these local social networks within the normal housing, because this is one of the big benefits that you have this local social network in co-housing. How can we integrate it or stimulate it within normal housing? So we, uh, together with the sociologists, we invented a system where tandems, intergenerational tandems, could apply for two flats together, and they were preferred to other um, uh, people who applied uh, as a single. And uh, the idea was that with these very small um, networks, you could actually stimulate uh, a bigger network within this block. The, uh, what was interesting is that there was really a big um, um, need for such uh, tandems, actually. So many people came and said, yeah, I wanted to I have a, a grandmother living far away and it's such a good idea, idea to, that we can apply together and live in two separate apartments but very close. Or uh, families who said, yeah, we want to share the, the children care <laughs> in an easy way. So there were really very, very different tandems, uh, not only families that came to apply for the apartments. Actually, we wanted to give 50% of the apartments in this system, and in the end, all, almost all of the apartments were given in this tandem system. And it really worked very well that over these small networks, uh, um, there was a lot more communication in these housing blocks. Yeah, I don't want to talk about the apartments. It's um, uh, all smart apartments in this uh, case. So all very compact, very flexible, uh, which is of course important for the affordability. Some impressions of the architecture. Yeah, maybe I skip the oase because it's maybe getting too long. It uh, was the idea to make um, uh, a co-housing with refugees. Uh, so we had a very... Um, low-level participation in this case. I just wanted to show it very short. So we tried to also adapt the system of co-housing so that it gets open to other groups like refugees together with um, partners like the Neuner House who take care um, of these people and so on to stretch a bit the, the boundaries of co-housing. Um, yeah, which brings me to the potentials um, and experiences that we make in co-housing. Um, and I want to start with what, what happens when you 
define um, architecture as a process where many, many people are involved and define uh, an architecture. What happens, of course, or what is important is that it changes the role of the architect, of course. This is maybe uh, the role of architect that we all grew up with. It's uh, the architect as the author of a masterpiece which works well for maybe a museum, of course, but maybe in housing it's not uh, the only way to, to get good um, solutions. So what we experience is that we have to change the role of the architect to maybe more a moderator uh, with a big ear <laughs> to the needs of the people and a translator of all these needs and also um, bringing together the experts with the non-experts in the process. <coughs> And what is also a great potential, what we see is that when you uh, create co-housing, you do not only get the hardware, um, what we call the architecture, the house, but always uh, you also create a software, which we call the community, um, that evolves in the, in, during the process. This is a picture of a co-housing in, in Lower Austria uh, from the ceremony when they moved in. So you see um, it's two processes on the same in the same time, it's the process of, of creating architecture and uh, community. And what you also get is an orgware, <laughs> if you want, uh, which actually makes it possible for many people to work together to, for self-management, uh, for making decisions together, which is also a big treasure on the way, um, on the, on the way after finishing architecture. Of course, for the users, it has many potentials uh, because trust one, I think um, in this sociocracy you learn to trust each other and which makes sharing of course more easier and uh, using instead of uh, owning only um, functions if people trust each other so they can share tools, they can share um, rooms and uh, it actually makes your life not only easier but richer. You spend a lot of more time together, for instance, for single parents. Um, this is very nice. This is our, a picture of our daily lunch we have uh, in the office together with people from the house. Um, you have a lot of um, access to space and time resources, uh, which makes life with children much easier, for instance, but also for elderly. You have new um, opportunities to work, for instance, when you're retired maybe, to start new projects together, it's easier and you find, always find people who, who will help you. And what we also observe is that um, actually hybrid forms between gainful um, employment and unpaid work are evolving, like food co-ops, uh, co-workings, uh, like this grocery store. So I think in times of crisis, these are very um, helpful tools uh, for our society, which make us uh, very resilient. Care work is becoming a common task. This is very important from a feministic point of view, I would say. And um, yeah, maybe the most important aspect I would point out uh, in times like this, when we have war, for instance, is that it's a good um, school of uh, democracy. You learn how to make decisions together, to have compromises. And um, when you grow strong as a community, it's also easier to help others, of course. That what we experience in the co-housing projects, that they are much faster in helping when refugees come, because they are already organized and they don't have to do it alone. So they organize more quickly. And maybe this is the most uh, gainful, uh, tr the, the greatest treasure co-housing actually holds. And uh, I want to start, when we started co-housing, we said, okay, we have to find new ways to judge our work because maybe it will not be the brightest architecture. So we said maybe what we want to reach is um, more love per square meter, not more euros per square meter or something like that. Uh, and to, to bring people together. And I think uh, this is what we really could reach um, and which is, um, which we are very happy and as a big treasure also for our work. So thank you very much. So thank you very much. That was um, very interesting. 
And now uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Carmen Espejel. She, well, most of you obviously know her, but for our guests also. She's PhD architect and full professor at the design department of the School of Architecture of Madrid, the ETSAM, where she also studied architecture. And she has taught in many countries, in Italy, United States, Belgium, the Netherlands. She has written many books and articles. And basically she focused her research on uh, collective housing, on architectural criticism and women and architecture. And she leads the collective housing research group at the ETSAM and gives doctorate courses and also in Porto and where she leads several doctoral theses and also she has an architecture office uh, whose works have been awarded on different occasions, winning several competitions national and international. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure uh, to be in such uh, an important international debate on affordable housing here in, in my country. Uh, the excuse is uh, the exhibition, no? the exhibition that we can see downstairs, the Vienna Model Housing for the 21st Century, with this, this frame, or within this framework of the uh, International Forum of the Union Internationale des Architects. Uh, where the question is the affordable housing activation. Um, well, I would like to thank um, Vienna City Council, uh, the Austrian Cultural Forum in Madrid and the Colegio de Arquitectos, particular, uh, to, particularly to Lorenzo, uh, for inviting me to think on uh, this, uh, what we can say, the, the question, no, the housing question, which is so essential to our uh, societies. Uh, and nowadays. In Spain, housing is a constitutional right since 1978, even if we cannot believe it, it's true. The Article 47 uh, says uh, all Spaniards have the right to enjoy decent and adequate housing. The public authorities shall promote the necessary conditions and establish appropriate standards to make this right effective, regulating land use, by the general interest to prevent speculation. Well, since the, the Constitution, uh, the Spanish state is organized uh, um, into municipalities, uh, provinces and autonomous communities, mainly for the people who is not from here, maybe doesn't know, and with various levels of autonomy and housing, the question of housing is, uh, is a jurisdiction of these uh, autonomous communities and uh, two autonomous cities in the south of Spain. Well. Um, traditionally, excuse me, that's it. Uh, traditionally, Spain has been a country that always uh, has built social housing, and where particularly uh, the best Spanish architects uh, of all times have been involved in its, in its design. We can see it here. Now, the theoretical architectural debate has been totally linked to the debate of housing architecture. Um, these examples that we see in this slide we speak about this quality. Most of them are housing built by public administration. In the post-war period, in the first uh, um, building, uh, excuse me, housing uh, complex in the left top of the slide, we can uh, see the satellite settlement of Caño Roto built by Antonio Vázquez de Castro and José Luis Iñigue de Onzoño, one of the most well-known, um, internationally well-known uh, projects, where they emphasized the uh, collective space as an extension of the dwelling and owned the patio, uh, patio houses that were very appropriate for our climate and idiosyncrasy. Um, at the beginning of the development period, in the 60s, Joaquin Aracil, uh, together with Lucho Miquel and uh, Antonio Viloria, investigated the way to make modern housing in a historic, uh, historic center like Segovia. In the 70s, uh, Taller de Arquitectura, led by Ricardo Bofil, uh, built Valden 7 in the outskirts of Barcelona sought uh, a way to build what they call a habitable utopia. In the 80s, for instance, Avalos and Herreros, in the housing complex uh, next to the M30, in, to the ring uh, in, in Madrid, uh, they proposed a model with a, a certain um, level of industrialization. And Manolo Casas, also in the same 
in the same line of, of uh, looking for uh, uh, new modes, uh, new ways to um, understand technology, work with heavy prefabrication systems without losing the particularity of the social and cultural context. And finally, Victor Lopez Cotelo showed us the architectural value of, of the pre-existences. Uh, in the, at the end of the 90s with this uh, dairy farm of the Vaqueria del Carmen in Santiago de Compostela. Research and housing have always been linked. Many of the great icons of modern architecture in Spain are residential buildings. These extraordinary housing developments are the result of the enormous um, effort of different communities of people, a structure in different ways under a public structure, most of the cases, and cooperatives uh, as Interai and Valden 7, and enrolled in this adventure of construction and inhabiting an ideal. But only some of them were thought uh, from a certain value of the common. Uh, uh, the Caño Roto, well, excuse me, Caño Roto was um, the self-construction in, uh, in Caño Roto uh, with the architect uh, Vázquez, uh, even Antonio Vázquez de Castro himself living in the settlement. It is, it is an incipient understanding of the sense of community. Uh, I remember uh, when Antonio uh, told me how his splendid new Mercedes that he drove from Germany on that time was used in the, in the neighbor as a taxi and an ambulance uh, by, by his neighbors. Uh, the Domingueros um, is a figure that uh, people who work during the Sundays, the Sunday years, we could say that in English, the Sunday years, uh, they work in the, in the site uh, in a very basic Mason Rim tasks uh, for 100 days in the sun uh, with pick and shovel and they pay 25 uh, less money for the houses. And uh, even because they didn't know um, how, what, what was, what was uh, their house, the uh, Seccion Femenina, the women's section, a Francoist organization, later awarded them by lottery, no? decided who was uh, going to live in, in, in one of those houses. In the Tarai, uh, is a cooperative. It, 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 the Tarai remains a European exception in terms of proper maintenance and operation of a social housing building in a gallery with a direct connection to the city that is still uh, works today incredibly uh, good. It is a community that still um, keeps an important sense of uh, its own identity. This ambitious, unique and generous complex is the result of a union between a workers' uh, cooperative with the same idea of what uh, house they wanted and a progressive group of, of architects. The high valuation and social understanding of the architecture by the residents shine from within a protect uh, is uh, as a pure use value. Balden is also a community, um, a very important community, but it was uh, built uh, with this uh, idea of the cooperative. And they wanted to, um, they decided to build a utopia. Uh, um, Anna Bofil, also one of the architects uh, from Taller de Arquitectura. Taller de Arquitectura was a very complex group with writers, philo thinkers, philosophers, uh, musicians, uh, architects, uh, sociologists. So it was a, a kind of a group that do sh you show us, even the photograph that you show us before was very similar to the one of the, in the 70s uh, of uh, Taller de Arquitectura. They wanted to um, uh, transform completely the, the typical houses that uh, it was built in that time. And they dream of a caving community with a sense of living that characterized them. Uh, they even called themselves Baldenites, Baldenitas. Um, Spain, um, uh, this uh, is intensity in affordable, excuse me, <coughs> in affordable housing, social housing um, has been maintained during the 21st century until the great crisis of the real estate bubble in 2008. Um, the now defunct Ministry of Housing, we don't have it anymore, promoted a public contest, for instance, of 5,688 social houses, uh, but only few of them were really built. 
some of the built uh, uh, examples are in the top of the slide. And the crisis already was in our homes. No? In Mieres, we can see ACM architects with a very interesting uh, project with this kind of um, coat, uh, plastic coat that covered from, uh, from the rain. And um, in uh, uh, zigzag architects with these two, uh, a building with two faces, the external very um, uh, rough or very uh, strong, and in the internal so, so sweet and so uh, kind. And also in Ceuta, in Ceuta we have the Super Sudaca Foundation. They also built one of these samples, but most of them uh, stayed in the in the contest uh, phase, no? As in Guadalajara, Mateo Eibar, and in, in Naval Carnero, Alonso Hernández, or Ayala architects. So important architects that they couldn't uh, f um, finish their works. And um, uh, I would like to highlight the work carried out by um, by uh, EMB Municipal Housing and Land Company of Madrid in the late uh, 90s and early 20s through new housing estates of the um, in the outskirts of Madrid teams as as um, Aranguren Gallegos ACM um, Al 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 Alverola Martorell uh, MV DRV uh, with Blanca Yeo or Entre Sitio and Carnicero, they, uh, they built new parts, or new housing, but also new parts of the city. The, uh, those new polygons were allocated uh, around uh, the perimeter of, of Madrid. They were um, able to, um, to research the quality, as you see, as you know, um, uh, Madrid was the, the plot of Europe on that time. Uh, between 2000 and 2008, uh, 4 million housing units were built in Spain, which means 0 0.5 uh, million a year. Uh, I'm talking about private and public. And social housing EMV in Madrid uh, built uh, per year 2,000 houses. So an enormous amount of that, of, uh, of these, uh, um, these uh, social houses. Um, as I said, uh, we were the, the solar of Europe, and uh, we can um, said even uh, that, in a way, um, the whole um, housing in Spain are uh, socialized, in a way, because, well, the, the one I show you are social, built mainly by, by the city councils, so by the administration, but in the, in the private developer, in developments, um, even the owner can get some uh, uh, subside by the state depending on their uh, incomes, on their salary. And, um, but that doesn't mean it is affordable because it is absolutely in, uh, in inside the, uh, the market. Nothing further. Uh, I love to... Um, I, I, I love this um, uh, cartoon by uh, Andres Ramago El Roto, the broken uh, uh, cartoonist uh, uh, who born in Madrid in 1947. And uh, well, as the poets, no? and sometimes the lunatics, uh, they explain the things much better than, than the rest of the people. And they, they see and they feel uh, um, the, the possession of the bubble, of the housing bubble, was explained with this. Uh, interesting as uh, interesting drawing and this was uh, how he perceived this um, the starting of the crisis I would like to um, and to finish this panorama by looking at some examples that confirm that uh, there is another way to act in housing matters first of all uh, in comparison with uh, Vienna uh, and, and with Austria most part of our uh, market is uh, um, uh, property and not uh, rented, and well, this uh, differentiates us very much. Even it was, if it was not the, uh, in that way in the 50s, in the 50s, uh, most of the bourgeoisie uh, live in, uh, in uh, rental houses. But uh, um, well, if you don't want to have, um, they say if. Uh, uh, if you don't have to, fa to have a proletarian, you have to transform them into uh, a, proprietarian, a proprietarian, uh, a, well, a, a, an owner. It's a kind of a joke. Uh, well, it's a, it's a sentence. Uh, um, 
pronounced by one minister of, of Franco. So they found in the property a way to control the uh, possible, the possible um, critical uh, groups in, in the state. But um, I want um, to, I chose three samples to talk about housing today in Spain in, in, in a different way, where the life is, a, is the center or how to live together is the center of the discourse. Um, there are three things that um, generally are, um, they are worried on all these, all the, in these uh, three cases, which, is, which are the climate conscious, consciousness, uh, the, um, the recharges, the recharges means the reuse, the uh, Recycle of old uh, factor of old um, uh, fabrics and, and, and buildings, and the third one, which is uh, this idea that you were explaining so beautifully in your examples, this idea of living and sharing and living and living together. In the first one, um, well, this is not um, uh, this concept, which is used everywhere, uh, is not a passing architecture or a formal fashion. Uh, even if uh, worn out cliches are sometimes used, but is a crucial, uh, crucial uh, issue in the thinking of our time. How we face natural environment, how we qualify excessive technology, and how the same domesticated technology can help us uh, find a balance between construction and conservation. The example I chose is a, a, a complex built in uh, Formentera, uh, and it is called Life of Reuse in Posidonia. It's a European and City Council promotion, monitoring since the first uh, moment till now where the rental houses are in the hands of the, of the tenants. Uh, they use local materials, uh, is a passive house, but uh, understanding the Mediterranean way of living, uh, understanding what does it mean these uh, medium or intermediate spaces between and inside and outside. Um, uh, for instance, in the, in the case of uh, Posidonia, they um, use, uh, they uh, draw this, uh, this uh, plan explaining the proximity of the materials and uh, how they were trying to avoid as a maximum, because it's, for it's an island, so they, they wanted to use as a maximum the, the local materials, but also to use less as possible the materials uh, from, from abroad. Uh, we can find in these reusable uh, or local eco-friendly products with marais uh, stone, or with the plasters, or um, I don't see, excuse me, but I cannot see, well, different materials, but also the Posidonia as a reusable local uh, waste material. The, the Posidonia Oceanica is, a, is that um, alga, uh, algae, algae, that we found in, the, in many of our of our beaches, and uh, instead of um, uh, placing to them to the, as a waste material, they uh, recollect that material, they dry it on, under the sun and uh, they compact a little bit to, to use it as a, as a 15 centimeters isolation uh, in the roof, um, which is uh, very interesting. But also they reuse all the materials, uh, all the doors and carpentries, uh, wooden carpentries that they found in the, in the island in other, in other buildings. Um, recycling. Uh, Nicolas, uh, Nicolas Borio uh, says that um, 20th century was the, the century for new constructions, and 25 or uh, 21st century is the we have to rewrite modernity in the historical. Uh, I mean, in a historical um, uh, way, uh, neither going back from scratch nor being overwhelmed by the storehouse of history not completely uh, um, collapse, by rather inventoring and selecting, using and recharging this architecture. The Gordian knot uh, resides in being able to establish the, a kind of genealogies between past and present and present and, 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 and past. In this case, I chose one of the samples in Barcelona, uh, the creation of the new uh, reuse of this um, factory the Fabre Coats uh, uh, factory, all, uh, an old spinning mill, 
and um, um, Barcelona had this, um, how do you call it, this creation factories, no? Crea artists creation factories uh, in, uh, in a belt, and they, they uh, transfer all, most of them in central, um, in, um, uh, in cultural centers, uh, but this is the first time that housing is part of that uh, renovation. Uh, in this case, it's uh, um, um, houses for artists who live there, but also who, pro uh, uh, um, who produce uh, new um, uh, objects, new uh, works uh, in, uh, together. So they, have, uh, they incorporate these uh, wooden boxes inside this old structure of brick and, uh, and metalwork. And, uh, but they kept this uh, idea of the collective, the, with the collective uh, uses, they um, uh, kept this uh, volume of the, of the factory, of the old factory, uh, with uh, these uh, marvelous uh, spaces where they can uh, produce these, uh, or combine a kind of uh, workshops, uh, collective workshops and private houses uh, in, the same, in the same place. It's also self-managed by the tenants, but this is built by, uh, I think it's uh, by the municipality. And uh, the last one um, is um, the last uh, Miss van der Rohe Prize, uh, the Emerging Architecture winner. And uh, they, th they express this idea of living and sharing. Now, the fact uh, of sharing is not an exclusive problem of multi-use and therefore uh, uh, of uh, in the space of optimization, but it is um, uh, related to the creation of communities, as you said before, and thus the inclusion of the agenda and, uh, of the agenda of belonging of those communities to those communities that are linked to the new sociability. The system of sharing spaces, uses, and activities implies sharing relationships, affections, and sensibilities. Opposed to the family, it is possible to think about the individual who chooses the way in which his or her private life develops in common and his or her relationships with, uh, um, uh, works with the, collectivity, uh, with the collective reality. In this way, the new collective groups acquire um, an evident relationship with the negotiation of a space and maybe what is more important uh, about the, the negotiation of the time also. Um, uh, the temporality of, the, of some spaces are in the, in the table. Okay, La Borda is the last project I will present, is in the, in the neighborhood, the Sands neighborhood, inside the recovery of Cambayo. Cambayo is also an industrial area, um, uh, also Renew. Um, it's located, maybe, uh, which is very particular for this uh, example, is that it's the only one that is connected with all the examples that uh, Katrina uh, showed us before, the real conception of uh, community that was since the beginning and that the um, city council helps them uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a way. No, I will explain it to you a little bit. Um, with this lease uh, hold of 75 years of the land. So they have this uh, um, cheap, uh, plot, they got this cheap uh, plot, they redefined the collective housing program completely uh, with um, uh, the, the five I I items, uh, most important items of this uh, project is that the self-promotion, uh, the right of use, the community life, the sustainability and the affordability. So it's a long process, as you uh, show us. It's a very long process. It, it started in 2012, and I think it was finished in 2021. Uh, even before finishing, they were living inside, even working, working with the last, uh, um, uh, with the last parts of the building. But since the very uh, beginning, uh, there are informal uh, meetings. Then um, the architect is not, an, is not an architect, as Ms. van der Rohe, uh, is an architect who plays that role of um, someone who can uh, organize uh, the, the whole group, 
uh, also like, uh, the, the architects live in the, in the building, that means uh, they are implied from the beginning till the end, and even nowadays in the maintenance of that uh, spirit. And uh, under the point of view of architecture, they define a very small cells, private cells, other cells that can be combined to these private minimum cells, so to enlarge uh, some of the houses, and also some um, units that are uh, pro, uh, foreseen for uh, sharing uh, among them. No? If, uh, if your, your family is visiting you, you, have, you can um, uh, take that, uh, that unit uh, for, uh, for, it, uh, for a time. <clears throat> and what is, uh, well, mm, what is important is that uh, these 28 houses, units that comes from uh, 40, 60 to 75 uh, square meters, had an enormous amount of, uh, of um, community spaces where they um, combine um, uh, and share kitchen, a communal kitchen with a dining room, a laundry, a multipurpose space, guest rooms, health space, storages, patio, bike, parking, and terraces with these open uh, spaces all around the building. <coughs> well, despite uh, being a constitutional right, rarely we have experienced so many difficulties in accessing uh, a decent home. After the Greek crisis of uh, 2008, the social promotion accommodation system was almost, almost dismantled. So it uh, decreased uh, the number and the quality. Residential has long been transformed into a large business. May, uh, perhaps this is a crucial reason why public pro promotion is not of interest nowadays. As the laws of the market filter through the walls of the house, the paradigm of the home as a space of vital re relevance, refuge and intimacy, separated from the sphere of work or collective encounter, is postponed and replaced by the profitability of a financial asset. Housing continues to be automatically and by inertia uh, a doing, repeating the same lifelong life models of what we, uh, we called VPO, official uh, protection housing. Only those city councils maybe that uh, have a greater impact on the common, on what they, they, they thought it was the common, we can found these new houses uh, construction systems. This is why it is uh, essential to identify the urgent, uh, the urgent need uh, to establish a fair and more inclusive society through the construction of social housing as an element that counteracts the deficiencies of the mercantile system by supporting the most disadvantaged uh, segments and therefore promotes better coexistence, reducing marginalization and insecurity. It is essential to restore housing as a basic pillar of our society. Therefore, uh, it is unavoidable from the political sphere to propose a regulation that works in this uh, direction in order to democratize, democratize and decommercialize the right to housing that we ben will benefit everyone, not only some of them, but everyone in, in the long term. Thank you very much. They work? Yeah, they work. Okay. Great. <laughs> so now the, the idea is to have a, a little debate. Um, and then, of course, uh, also the idea that you can ask questions afterwards. <laughs> so maybe uh, different things we could talk about. Uh, I, would, I would like, um, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Very interesting both lectures. Uh, maybe we could talk about Vienna and this special case of, of Vienna and, and this social housing model, right? And somehow the question is how can we learn <coughs> about it now without falling into this direct comparison? No? But uh, what would you say, having built this special typology within the social housing, what, what are the most important key aspects or what, what can we learn about this model of, of, of the Vienna model? No? Um, that's a difficult question yeah, no, I know, <laughs> in the beginning. I know, I know, but <laughs> um, yeah, I think 
what what makes it so special uh, in Vienna that it is ha has a great continuity already. Uh, it started in the 20s, 30s, and and uh, uh, actually the city never sold the apartments uh, and so on. So, um, but it's not only continuity. It also says in the, in the exhibition um, that you not try to build social housing for the poorest only, but you try to make it an integrative uh, part um, of for for the whole society and um and uh, yeah and then really bring quality into it so it's not a, a very basic housing but it's the best housing <laughs> actually in vienna you can say it's the subsidized housing and uh, um, because i think you cannot leave um, the solutions of the problems we are facing. You cannot leave it to the free market. We already saw it. <laughs> it's not possible. It's not solving our problems. Uh, it's making them bigger. Um, so we have to try to find um, systems where politics, but also we as a, a civil society can influence the housing in the way we need it. So it has to be very close to the needs of the future users because what should we build housing for if not for the uh, inhabitants <laughs> it's not a, a speculation <laughs> yeah of course but the interesting thing is that this bottom up as you said is possible because there's a very strong up down structure that makes it possible yeah i think it's a good balance <laughs> yeah that's yeah. that's the point no so you have a like a system mm -hmm. that allows you know this this, this kind of yeah, I think you cannot rebuild the system of Vienna within a few years. It's something that has a very <laughs> long uh, way, very uh, big uh, structure that is bearing it. And uh, people really trust in social housing in Vienna. So the developers, the, the inhabitants. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a long way, but uh, it's, it's important to start and um, to not uh, stop it when there is a slight <laughs> problem. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think, um, Carmen, yes. Sorry, I think is a is a is a question of the state of this total soci society that uh, has decided this model as a way of living since a long time. And uh, of course, <coughs> I think, as you said, is a mix. No, is a good balance between the top-down uh, decisions because there are all, a lot of um, helps and um, um, yes, and laws and everything, and, and banks and even uh, companies and so on, that uh, helps to, do, uh, to be able to, to work in that way. And also is a, um, is a question of being very close to the users, to the uh, future uh, in, uh, um, in inhabitants and and to to uh, go uh, up with this or to go bottom up uh, with this model so i think it's a combination but but there is a a, a very a strong is a state uh, a conception uh, question of what is housing for them no or what is housing for you so it's not a, it's not the market it's something that everybody needs and they have to do it uh, or they do it in this way but for us, it's just uh, well. It's, it's really a, not the reverse, but with, we are completely involved by this idea of the market, and this is very, <clears throat> very difficult. No, this is why it's very difficult to promote uh, samples as, as as we saw uh, these few samples that I uh, that I uh, brought here, but also samples as as, as you um, show us, because of these. Um, uh, market who, which is all around <laughs> and it's quite difficult. Yeah, I think what is also an important aspect is that the city of Vienna is uh, owning a lot of land within the city, so they have a big influence uh, uh, compared to other cities, even in Austria, when, when the city or the, uh, the state doesn't own the land, um, their influence is not so big, uh, of course, on the housing market. So the city of Vienna is um, co um, continuously buying land also, and now I think they started also to not sell them to the, to the developers, but to keep them, as you said, with this um, um, loan, or how do you say, um, yeah, for 100 years, but the, the grants transfer to of transfer <coughs> of, land, yeah, yeah. of land. And uh, yeah, it's a limited resource, and we have to uh, think of um, who should own it in, in the future. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, of course. And what you said is also interesting that this uh, social or subsidized housing can be even of a higher quality than the free market housing, no? Which is... Well, here we have the same. Yeah. Yeah. Social houses that we have uh, are much better than the, than the private one. This, I can assure you, <laughs> even in the square meters, but also in quality, in construction, in everything, no? Mm, but um, I can say the question is that even social houses that we produce all, uh, all these years that were uh, oriented to rental and were uh, conceived as a rental houses, uh, with the time were sold to the users or to other um, actors. No? Uh, in that sense, that um, uh, marvelous uh, patrimony that, that, that Vienna Council has nowadays, because they, di they didn't sell it or they hadn't sold it, we don't have it. We don't have it in that, in that terms, in that uh, big terms. Yeah, of course, this is very difficult to apply to another city, you know, this type mm -hmm. of... But what do you think should be maybe done then in, in, in Spain or in Madrid? What, what would be a possibility to make affordable housing in, in the case of, of Spain? No? What? Of course, of course, I think we can do it. Uh, in the 90s, uh, uh, there was a big implosion of uh, social houses and very important and the competitions were open and every architect could uh, um, arrive to that competitions were not close as, as they are nowadays, a little bit close, no? or a little bit uh, complicated to access to those competitions. So we can do it because we did it. And even we can, what we have to think is about the, the future of this uh, social housing. If we have to um, increase the rental, uh, the, the conception of the rental houses, th that means houses that uh, are perfect for some um, individuals or uh, families or groups in a certain moment of their, their life and whenever they uh, um, get a better uh, level that uh, houses goes to a different uh, sector, to a different people. So um, that conception which is absolutely important, we don't have it for the moment because we have this idea of a false, rent, uh, false uh, purchase rental or something like that. No? We buy but uh, um, imagine, well, or, um, um, well okay, I will, <laughs> I will not say anything else. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a very complex system, the housing yeah. market always. It's a lot of laws <laughs> um, that, that are influencing it. And uh, so uh, it's not only a question of architecture and to build it, but then what happens with the apartments on a long run, how are they rented or bought uh, or whatever. In Vienna, for instance, now uh, they also have um, an, a new law actually because the city saw there's a lot of housing built um, in the last years also free financed housing and they don't have uh, so much land anymore uh, and they also saw that there is a speculation with the ground because people try to keep their grounds and try to wait until the um, the prices are going up and then they introduced a new law um, um, that uh, actually one third, uh, if there is a um, um, yeah. Um, uh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry. The urban dedication. Dedication uh, says that one third um, of the volume that can be built there has to be social housing. So everybody who buys this plot actually has to build a certain amount of social housing uh, on on that site. And so I think it's. You have to go very deep into the laws and the law system um, to to change things slowly. I mean, it's uh, it's something it's a, that happened in Barcelona, for example, that they made this law of the one third, also of the new housing uh, projects that are bigger than a certain amount of houses. They have to have a third that is uh, affordable housing, which is, is yeah. There's quite a lot of cities that we have in in in, in the um, in the polygons in the. Uh, in these big uh, new parts of the city, uh, yes, and it is defined that some part of the of those houses has to be uh, social, which is nice. Is in that in Europe 
they, uh, for instance, in France, because of the looking for the mixité, uh, the m a mix uh, of uh, different um, uh, a social mix, no? Uh, or uh, the Netherlands the, with this idea also of combining uh, social and uh, private houses. They combine it even in the same building, which happens in Vienna. Which too. happens in Vienna, and also that is uh, is very difficult for us in terms of, um, of, of well of uh, management uh, but, but but of course we we can uh, we can do it i think there are two questions that maybe could be in the in the political uh, debate. Uh, debate which is the uh, this idea of the right of use and the uh, right of surface the right of use is uh, in in la borda we saw both the right of use is that the owner is not uh, the private uh, peop the, the, the persons, the owner is the cooperative. Mm, uh, well, you explain something like that. So the owner, is the, co the owner of the building is the cooperative. So mm, the, mm, the tenants never will uh, have that mm, property as their own. It's the cooperative property. So you cannot sell it. It's, uh, you can sell your, the, the right of use. You can sell it in a limited uh, money. That means there is no speculation on the on the building, uh, which I think is a, is a very important because uh, it is more important the the common good that the individual uh, benefits. And the second question is the right of use. The right of use, uh, well, is uh, to understand a little bit. It's like the marinas, no? The, the city council gives some uh, um, um, transfer. The land, uh, uh, the, the council uh, keeps the, um, the ownership of that land, but transfer the lands for a period of time, 75 or 100 years, as in the marinas or in, the, in these, uh, uh, in these uh, things. Uh, what happened? The, the city council never lost the, the property, never lost the lands. And at the end of that time, normally they uh, continue with this renovation. They pay a canon, they pay a, a kind of a rent, annual rent, all the community. And this is what they also got in uh, Barcelona. But it was a decision of the city council to look for that solution that was really, really, uh, really new uh, in, this, in, the, in Spain. So when we come to this, um, type of co-housing projects, no, which you showed and I think is so interesting. Um, what do you think is the, the, the most important aspects you have to keep in mind uh, when you plan it as an architecture and, and realize it? No? So what is really the, the most, for you, after all this time no, that you learn, so what, what is the point you have to focus on no, to make it a successful uh, project? Because it sounds quite complex. Yeah, I think it's important to learn from other projects. Is the first thing, you don't have to invent everything. We also try to uh, learn from the older projects and interview the architects. Um, so don't start from scratch. It's, it's too complex. And um, the other thing is, um, I think, as you said, you have to put the common goals um, in front uh, of the individual goals. And therefore, we always start um, to with a vision, with a vision of the group of how they want to live together. They have to have something where they re that they really share as an idea um, that brings them together. And along this vision, uh, they set their goals. And then it's easy in this complex process uh, of, of building a house to, z to decide along their goals, their common goals. Um, because otherwise it's too easy to, to lose uh, direction in, in such a complex uh, process. And um, yeah, this is one important thing. Then organization is very important. It's really a thing you shouldn't forget. Um, you cannot start it with, without a, an idea of how you want to go through this process. But on the other hand, you cannot control it totally. So it's a good balance between <laughs> organization, but uh, also a flow through, uh, through something that is alive. Yeah, and then I would uh, also say that ownership is an important thing. We always say it has to be collective ownership or owned by a cooperative, a third uh, owner. Um, because what, uh, what we um, experience is that these old projects that were private ownership um, 
they didn't survive as community projects. Ownership always kills uh, the community uh, on the long run. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and what would you say are the limits if you do this uh, type of co-housing as an architect? I mean, where's, where's really a point that you, you feel like uh, these are the real challenges or you feel like this is... Uh, Too much. <laughs> to my, no, where the architecture becomes uh, um, yeah. to a limit where you can uh, sort of control the project or realize it. And we actually, uh, maybe it doesn't look like, but we have very strict rules <laughs> yeah. uh, within the process so that you can survive as an architect. We have very strict rules, some things you cannot touch in the participation. People cannot call us. Uh, if 50 people try to call you every day, it's not possible. So also for communication, we have very strict rules so that you uh, have an uh, organized way of how to communicate, how you have to document everything so that people can read the questions they ask uh, because they will emerge again. So re redundance, I say, is very important. And. Um, yeah, the other thing is you don't make it for free, it's, it's work and it should be paid. So we make a contract with the people, they pay for it. For the individual it's not expensive, but for us it's important. And um, yeah, many, many things to learn uh, about it on the way. Um, yeah. yeah but, but all the rules, I mean, the protocols are really strong uh, and rigid and, and strict, as you said. Because it, they, they have a long uh, tradition, a long history on that. They, they know how to do it. You cannot do it by yourself uh, without any, any, um, any basis. So the, uh, Denmark, well, Germany, uh, Switzerland, Austria, they have all these um, system very, um, def very well defined mm. through these uh, 100 years or more. So we don't have to invent anything. We have to go there and to look how they do it and to follow that protocol. So that I think is absolutely important. And the other question is, <coughs> and they have in common a dream, a dream of living with an affordable way. And that is the most important question that has to be behind the group and behind these cooperatives. And this is what, what we found in also in La Borda, this implication of what we need to live in different way as we found in, in, uh, in the houses that uh, uh, companies built. I, I want to add, you have to have a dream. This is very important um, <laughs> to have a vision, but you also have to see um, that it's not a multi-lifetime dream. If you want to uh, make a project, you also have to make compromises. It will not be, not everything will be possible. We already had groups that really had big, 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 big goals, but that's what we call a multi-lifetime dream. You can realize it in three lives, but not in one life. So uh, we always also, um, if, if groups come to you, you have always have also to test a bit, are they willing really to, to do it? Or are they just, they want to make everything better and very, very different? Yeah, it's also, you have to check, I think, because as an architect, there's a lot of work, and then if people are not willing to make compromises, it's really hard uh, if you see that they uh, fail, actually. That's what you said about the change of the role of the architect also, no? That you're kind of, from the very beginning, in a different role. It's not about this big project making it the very best to the initial design, but it's this process, no? The architecture is a process. Yeah, instead of a um, vertical process, a vertical uh, mm. hierarchical process or um, way of doing, uh, is a horizontal process, which is absolutely different. Anyway, I, I wanted to say also that uh, in those cases, in all those projects that we see, in, uh, for instance, in Calvrete in, uh, in Zurich, uh, Calvrete, or uh, the, the one you show as the... Um, uh, mm, more than a li more than in more than a living no more more than housing yeah, yeah. more than housing uh, also in in, in a, all these cases uh, there is a big dif um, a very well uh, defined difference between inside uh, the private and the public so between the bed and the square there is an enormous amount of gray spaces or spaces that has to be defined and that that has different rules and different ways of uh, 
comportarse, way, behavior, behavior. Yeah. So that is also very well defined in all the examples that you show us, in, in particularly in the one in in, in Vienna. No? In our, and and Vienna. what I was thinking, you were showing this change of uh, the family structure and the at the end the typologies that are required in architecture. No, mm -hmm. and so. Um, what do you think now nowadays are really or what is the how is the architecture well or how is the the needs changing uh, in terms of typologies no and 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 how can we then integrate them no because there is obviously on one hand you have this need to to be together no and, and but on the other hand the structure of families completely change also no which requires a new way to think of the spaces also no? Yeah, I think the best way is um, if there's not participation, because we work very closely to the users. So um, I think the benefit is that we don't only give private spaces to the housing, but also these community spaces that are also flexible spaces that can change and maybe more easy change than the private ones. But on the long run, uh, we always try to also build flexible structures that can evolve <laughs> over um, uh, a lifetime um, so that there can be small changes within the apartments but also bigger changes but the flexibility in architecture is yeah, is a it's a, a lot no? it's a complicated thing because time shows that it doesn't work <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and so I would say yeah it's maybe it's not so much about um, typologies but about diversity and the the and and for the long run flexible systems that can be overdone and uh, and really find uh, new solutions like the Gründerzeit in Vienna is a very flexible system uh, and the housing from the, the, the housing, turn of the century yeah. yes from the turn of the century I think it's there's no no right answer maybe to this question of flexibility and uh, yeah. Well, what do you think, Amelie? Uh, You're investigating. Flexibility could be, uh, I mean, the question of flexibility is a question of square meters. If you have an enormous amount of square meters in your house, you have the whole flexibility of the world. So it's not a problem of flexibility, it's not a problem of, of typology, it's a problem of how the people live nowadays. And they live in a completely different way. So I think we have to uh, now make a, a radiography of, the, of, the so, of our social, uh, or the, 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 the so our society and, and look what happened and how the people live. Uh, there, there are no families anymore in the sense of the, traditions fa the traditional families we inherited. <laughs> there, are, well, uh, there are some, but a few. I mean, in the 20th century, we have this kind of diagram of homogeneous uh, society. All uh, our society was composed by families with two, three, four, five, six children. But well, generally, when from two to from to four, uh, and and then uh, we produce this kind of uh, enormous amounts of uh, housing all around the city, full with the same type of uh, with the same section of the society with the same couples. No, yeah. uh, what a boring. In that sense, I, I um, realize that most of these uh, samples also combine people intergeneration, intergeneration uh, questions of people with different uh, targets and different, um, uh, uh, can I say, uh, ideas uh, that could even com um, complement one uh, to others uh, with absolutely different ways of living. So, well, that uh, um, mixité, uh, what the French <laughs> says mixité, it has to be a, a part of the project. It has to be at least a study or research in the project. So in, in this sense, maybe to come to an end, for, for the future of your work, no? what do you think are the challenges you're facing like with your work in Vienna to do affordable housing or social housing? No? Well, I think um, the challenges are really manifold, as I showed. It's not uh, one thing you can concentrate on. Actually, all the problems that I was talking about uh, are not solved, but getting uh, maybe uh, worse, like the ecological uh, question uh, we have. 
the, now we have the problem with the resources. Uh, how can we even build new houses? Are there enough resources? Uh, and all this is um, not helpful for the affordability, of course. <laughs> so um, I think, uh, yeah, we will have a lot of uh, work as architects to find, to really um, totally redefine the way we build houses. Um, and uh, also for, of course, for the city, um, uh, how can we, uh, yeah, um, keep this system of social housing in when when we don't have resources, we don't have land, um, when we have a lot of crises that we we'll, that we will still face in the future, uh, in a very fluent and and um, yeah society. I think. I don't have the questions, but I think the ecological question is can you cannot uh, no longer separate it from the economic question. It's, it's became one and we have to see it as one and we have to um, work on it uh, together. And um, yeah, for us as architects, I think it's the biggest um, challenge now to see how can we, how can we build without using too much resources. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Carmen, are the challenges we yeah, face? I think it's well, um, sustainability has to be inside or in the center, in the core of the of the project, of course, uh, but not as some, some aesthetical questions, but uh, as, as something, as, as she says, uh, substantial. That means uh, we don't have to, uh, to talk or to think on short term, but in long term. What does it mean to use a material that is not... Uh, uh, five kilometers far away, but it uh, comes from China. Or, or we, we need to, to think on that. And also, well, in, uh, as Mediterraneans, I think we have to take the normative of the North and uh, transform it completely <laughs> because they have another requirements, yeah. mainly cold, and we need a big requirement, mainly uh, hot. Yeah. So our tradition, our uh, way of doing houses in uh, in the history, we, we have to learn from that. So for us, it's more important the passive uh, houses, in the sense of understanding them, the methods of um, uh, isolate, but also to um, uh, area uh, uh, to make the aeration of the of the house and the ventilation of the house and to control the. Um, the protection from the sun than to have these marvelous uh, um, um, regulations that come from the north and oblige us to uh, build uh, perfect windows <coughs> with an automatic opening yeah. for the aeration. We used to open every day the door, the, the windows and the door, so we have to rethink very much that uh, um, um, uh, to, uh, top down <laughs> regulations to um, uh, place it on our um, on our um, region and now maybe if there's some questions also you you want to do this now you could don't be shy it's it's your moment if you want to ask something to Catalina Bayer or maybe Carmen Espejel is there anybody who wants to ask a question nothing Yes? I don't know if there's a microphone. You can take that. <laughs> I mean, mainly my question is, do you think like Spanish society is ready for co-housing living and how maybe can this, how could we encourage people on this way of uh, living? I don't know the Spanish <laughs> society as well, but um, I think you saw uh, the, the example in Barcelona. I think um, there are potentials of causing. It's not like the whole um, Austrian uh, population is uh, um, ready for co-housing, but uh, there was a lot of research that even if only five to 10% can imagine to start such prog uh, um, projects, it is already a lot of people. I mean, Madrid is a big city, so you will find these pioneers, if you have to find these pioneers that are willing um, to start such projects, and then people see, it's a process also, people see, ah, there are alternatives. I don't have to own my house. I don't have to live in a small apartment uh, on my own. And I think only with these 
build examples, there will be uh, an evolution in co-housing. It's nothing that you can bring from outside. It has to be experienced um, um, in a way. But I th I'm sure that there are enough people in, in Madrid <laughs> to start it. <laughs> There are there are a lot of cases already, not so many, but they they are starting. We have in in Valencia, in Barcelona, in the in Basque Country, in in Madrid also, uh, mainly linked or related with the um, old people that want to live together because, as as you said, because they need to to have to care at the same time, uh, and they well they need they have some uh, needs and requirements that. Uh, place them on together now that uh, so I think the question is not if we are pre ready for that I think the question is are we ready for an affordable house we are and you are ready for that I mean the way to get an affordable house so a house that doesn't cost millions most of our jump uh, of our uh, the, the young people of Spain cannot arrive cannot uh, reach a house cannot, cannot buy a house or rent it cannot do it. They spend almost 60 and 70 percent of their uh, incomes uh, in the in the housing. What means? I don't know what they eat. Uh, this is crazy. So we, we that that question is the, the the right one. Are we ready for the for affordable? And there are several possibilities. One is uh, the one we saw today in Vienna, but there are other in Europe. And in countries that we cannot say they are, how can I say, um, left uh, uh, left countries, no? or uh, countries with the, with this idea of the the sharing as something uh, that is um, is an obligation, no? Because we are poor, no, no, no. The sharing is is a, um, nowadays is not uh, uh, something that we do because we are poor. It's something that we do because we can get m a lot of things that we cannot get by ourselves. So sharing, in, in these cases, in these societies, in the center of Europe, of course they take care a lot, as you said, uh, uh, about um, how to build or how to socialize. We, we have enormous amount of socialization here, so maybe that that is not our case, but we have other problems and the and the cost of the of the house is one of our problems and we uh, denominate co housing to enormous amount of things that are just the reverse of the co housing is a, is a market using that word <laughs> yeah that's also interesting. Is there any other question? <coughs> Thank you. Um, I basically wanted to ask how you see the potential for self-building within um, co-housing or uh, affordable housing in general. Um, and I also wanted to say uh, maybe a second question. This is one. And the second is a little bit about how you feel. Uh, I don't know. I live in an, one of these new quarters next to one of the houses you actually built, uh, Gleis 21. And I can really state that there's a very, very positive ins um, impact from the Baugruppen projects, from the co-housing projects in the area, because they are very well connected to each other. And for instance, when the pedestrian area in front of the house was supposed to be only a car restricted area in a way, they needed like three days until they had 500 orthographs and came up with a petition, uh, a petition and were knocking on the doors of the local authorities saying, we want this to be a pedestrian uh, area as it was promised so and they are also the ones who I don't know are starting community projects like um, community garden and other things in the area so it's really on the one hand a little bit about the people who are living there it's a sp also a specific type who is, uh, who is attracted to it but it's really about being connected in a way and uh, maybe something so this would be uh, just a statement on it um, but I also realized that some of them are saying, okay, all this upkeep, all this connection, all this um, being in contact with everybody, there's a lot of caretaking on all the areas that you incorporate in a house. And um, do you experience in some of the projects that people are saying like, okay, looking back, maybe we should have done less of this. Yeah, because uh, like, it's just a question, maybe they don't, but uh, I would be interested if this is the case. And yeah, the first question again, um, I mean, it's quite funny. I'm in one of those new houses and uh, I think there's a lot of 
I am very often wondering about this and about all the restrictions we have and all the regulations. Because in self-building, for instance, I moved into this new house and uh, everything is contracted. You can only get a new floor through the contractor that you signed for. And I know personally two neighbors who basically got this laminate floor. And they didn't even bother anymore about getting a, the wooden floor that they wanted through this company. They were so fed up with it. They bought it. They immediately ripped it out on their own and they put a different floor. And I was actually considering it myself. We ended up paying less and doing it through the company. So it was good to do it in the end, uh, the official way. But it was very odd and strange that you would buy a new house and then you would, uh, a new flat, I mean, and then you would realize uh, that you're within this regulation already that you have to go through this and this company with all these deals that are already being made. And you end up, I don't know, just taking out the floor and asking somebody else to do it in the end instead of, you know. So maybe this is a little bit connected on this uh, topic of, yeah, could they have done it as Robau? Could they have sold the kind of Ausbau house or things like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to that question is, is quite complex because um, in, in uh, um, subsidized housing, it's not allowed to give a, over an apartment without the surfaces. Uh, it's also a question of um, Haftung, how to say, um, um, yeah, of, uh, of that you have, uh, if, you, if you do something yourself, you can damage other things and, uh, and who, who pays for it <laughs> like this. And um, yeah, it's complex. We tried uh, things like that, but it makes it so complicated, actually, that as you said, it's better to integrate it in the process. So better you ask very early <laughs> if you want another floor. Uh, the later you do it, the more complicated, actually. That's, that's a problem of many, many rules and laws and we have to follow. Um, there have been experiments for self-building uh, projects within participation. They all showed it's not getting cheaper. Uh, as a, as a, as a, because there were these ideas that if people can do it by themselves, it's getting cheaper. But uh, the, the truth was it never became cheaper. It's a lot of work. And uh, if you buy things individually, it's more um, expensive than if you, if you buy it for a big house. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm quite, there are like the Ausbau House in Berlin. If you, I don't know if you know it. There are experiments like this um, on the private market. And I think it's interesting for individuality. Um, yeah, but for affordability, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of paradox, but uh, it is. You cannot leave things away <laughs> in a way. Um, for this too much, yeah, I think you can have too much community spaces as well because they all have to be managed, uh, care, taken care of and so on. So you have to try to find a balance, um, a good balance. We say 10% of the housing surface maybe is a good uh, indicator if you say not more than 10%. Um, but also depends on the energy of the group, of course. I mean. Uh, it is something you have to decide how much caretaking do, do you want, how much um, do you reduce your individual space also, do you use it intensely or do you have a really big apartment and then never time to, to go out <laughs> because you have to take care of it. So many, many decisions um, to made along the way. We say within this co-housing project, it's 40,000 decisions you have to make <laughs> if you want to count them. Um, so uh, you can only do it step by step. And uh, um, yeah, it's important to have a good uh, project team that guides you through it, I would say. Yeah. I think there was one question here. Um, it's working. Yes. <laughs> you have to. Okay. Uh, okay, so I was just curious because it was really impressive that you discussed with the residents of the common housing with with the project you did in Austria because um, so the question is that that you discussed what to do with that housing with the residents and what if they like plan to go to another country or they move out 
will there be other residents that will fit the housing that is designed for them? Yeah, if, when you move out, you give back um, your flat to the association and they are searching the future inhabitants. Um, my experience is that the ground floors, they are not so individual or there is also kind of rules within the associations that a, a, um, very individual solutions are not allowed, for instance. <laughs> so um, if, you, if it makes it impossible to re-rent it uh, for the association, they also have like a veto to say, no, this is, sorry, this is too. <laughs> or if you move out, you have to, um, to re rebuild it or something. So I, my experience is that it's not so very extravagant solutions you get, but it's very precise on the need of the people. So. Um, and um, uh, you, you get a big variety of, of apartments. And I think in Vienna, at least, it's no problem to, to find uh, another tenant if, if people move out. It's, it's so many people in search of flats. What I also experienced is at the moment, there is a, a very few big flats on the market, for instance. Nobody builds big flats for big families anymore because yeah, speculation is better with small flats. <laughs> and. Uh, in co-housing now, many people come, like big families with three, four, five children who say, I have to join a co-housing project because nobody builds me a big apartment anymore. So it's also a door for people who really cannot find a fitting space on the market because it's not the mainstream, maybe. So I, I'm afraid I think we have to come to an end. But uh, we will go down to the, well, there's a little um, drink you can have, and then uh, the exhibition is at the, uh, the ground floor, and you can also ask more questions there if you want. So I want to thank you very much. It has been very, very nice. Thank you for coming, especially from Vienna. Thank you, Carmen, for being here with us. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.